It's not until we get to the edge that we can appreciate the depth of our brokenness. It is here that we come to the end, the end of ourselves, the end of options, the end of rationalizing outcomes and fighting for control, the end of maybes and what ifs. And it's here when we have nowhere else to turn that, that we look to our Father, the one who hears us when we cry out, the one who sees us when we fall. It's at this end that we draw closer to God than ever before. We are desperate. We are in a series uh, where we've been talking about how desperation is a gift. Desperation, if you were to define it, can be defined like this. It says, desperation is a state of despair uh, which is typically results in a rash or extreme behavior. And so uh, it's a state of despair. And most of us, when it comes to desperation, we don't sit here and think, boy, I am, I am so glad that I am desperate. You know, it's not like something like, oh, goody, today I get this gift, and it's called desperation. Not very many of us take it as a compliment when someone comes up to us and says, hey, I see that you're dating so-and-so. She must be desperate. You know, it's not like, oh, you're right, you're so right. And uh, it's just, we don't take it that way. And so it's weird for us to hear and to see something where it talks about how desperation is a gift. But being desperate, it might actually, it could just be a gift. And here's why. Being desperate causes us to take risk to make bold moves, it causes us to drop our pride, it causes us to surrender, to submit, or to change the course of life, which might be exactly why God wants us to be desperate. And it might actually be the very best place for us because it can actually cause us to change our life, which would be why it would be considered a gift. And so this morning we're going to take a look at a guy from Mark chapter 10. His name is Bartimaeus. And uh, he was desperate. And you're going to hear desperation all over in his story. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Mark chapter 10. There are also Bibles right in front of you, on the seats in front of you. But all the scriptures will also be up on the screen as well. And so Mark chapter 10, verses 46, and it says this. It says, then they came to Jericho, and as the disciples, or as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city... It says, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside, and he was begging. And so this man, Bartimaeus, he was sitting along the roadside between Jericho and Jerusalem, and he was a beggar. And not only was he a beggar, but he was blind. And so there was, you know, you'd say, well, that's interesting. He was a beggar because he was blind, and that would make sense at that time, but doesn't necessarily make sense at this time. And the reason is because we have programs. We have government programs that help people like this, or we have some sort of laws or rules of employment where people can get jobs. Uh, we've got programs. There's Braille that, that people who are blind can read so they can be educated in other ways other than just hearing. And so we have some advantages where this man, he had nothing. He would have been a huge weight on his family for them to take care of him all the time. And so it only makes sense that they would say, all right, well, we can't really take care of him. And so we're going to place him out on the road and he will be begging people as they, they pass by for money. He was solely 100%, 100% supported by the people who would walk by and who would be generous enough to give him some sort of de donation. And so I'm guessing the reason why Bartimaeus would have chosen the road between Jericho and Jerusalem, it makes sense for a couple of reasons. The, you know, and, and, and as they make sense, he would have, be, and I'll explain that in a second, he would have probably been advised by many people, you need to be on that road between Jericho and Jerusalem. You know, and there was all people telling him advice, like probably telling him like, hey, when you call out, you need to call out like this. You need to put your can on. You need to tap your can or you need to be on this, this street corner and not this street corner. And you need, there's probably people who gave him tons of advice. And it's usually how it works with people who are desperate. I mean, if you think about it, if you're desperate, there's always somebody willing to give you some sort of piece of advice because they will say if you're desperate to be fit or to be healthy or to be wealthy or to be happy or to be young again or to be off of drugs or to whatever it may be, there's somebody who is willing to give you a piece of advice. 
And I'm betting the most common words that desperate people hear, and, and if you're desperate this morning, you probably maybe even heard this today. You need to, here's what you need. Here's what you need. Here's what you, you know what you need. You know what you need. You know what you need. Here's what you need. Here's what you need. And so the, after they follow that up, they'll follow up with something that says like, you know what you need. You need to drink this shake or you need to diffuse this oil. You need to eat these foods. You need to pop these pills. You need to wear these magnets. You need to buy this product. You need to have this surgery. You need to invest in this business. You need to apply for this job. You need, you need, you need, you need, you need. And they always have tons of advice for you. Tons of advice for you. But the problem is, is the advice that we receive from people most of the time is only good for a very limited amount of time. It's, it's a temporary fix. It's not a long-term solution. It's just something that will help you get by to the next day, but not something that's going to change your life forever. And so it makes sense through the advice that this guy received that he would be sitting on the road between Jericho and Jerusalem for the first reason would be this is because people on that road would have been very generous. You see, every year Jews would make their pilgrimage and they would, and they would come through Jericho on their way to Jerusalem to the temple to worship. And so as they're traveling along, one, they have their money because they're going to Jerusalem to pay if you will, or to give their tithes or whatever. And so they have that money, plus they have their traveling money. And so they, he, they would be along this road. There would be peop, these people that are there asking for, for money and for help. And so they would be generous along the way. And after all, let's be honest, they were already doing the right thing. They were already doing a good thing. They were going to the temple to worship. It's kind of like going to church. You should be, if you aren't, because you get up on a Sunday morning and you start to go to church, you've already started off your day doing a good thing. And so as you're coming to church, you may even notice this on the way in here, that you, you come in and as you're coming into church, you, you know, all these cars are going in and cutting in and, and you just see them and they cut in front of you and you're just like, hey, that's all right, it's good. Yeah, absolutely, you know, you first, all, no problem, you know. Oh, you took that spot close to the building, that's all right, I'll park way back here in the back, you're good, you know, and you're all happy and everything's fine. And so you're going to church, and you're already set on doing a good thing. You're in a good mood. But after church is over, you know, even before church, you're like, oh, hey, let me get this door. And you start looking, and the line's coming in, you know, and you're like, I'm going to be here for a while. But that's fine. Hey, yes, good to see you. Praise Jesus. Yeah, whatever, you know. And so you say all this stuff. After church, you're like, like, don't look at anybody. Just open the door and let it drop. Do not look behind you. You know, get out. And you're, you know, pulling out. Just get, just get the back of the car out. People will stop. Just get it out, you know. And so it's out there. And then the person behind there is smiling, you know, on the way out. Like, sir, this was good this morning. And then someone starts to back out in front of them. They're like, oh, no, you didn't. And just keeping a smile on their face. You know, I can't believe they're rolling out in front of me. And now I'm all the way in the back. Do you think they'll care if I just cut through here? I know it's cutting in line. But, you know, hey, these people love Jesus, right? They'll be, you know. And so whatever it is, you know, it's a whole different game after church. And so this guy, he's no dummy. He's like, hey, I'm going to sit between here and here because I know that people are going to Jerusalem. And a generous, good, worthy thing to do is to give to the poor people along the road. And so he had placed himself in a great position. He also was close to Jericho. Another reason was because Jericho was known to be a city that had great agriculture, uh, a great produce, a great vegetation that was good and beneficial for eyesight. And so there were probably some people said, hey, so I, I know that you can't see very well. Have you ever thought about going to Jericho? Because I've heard that they've got this medication there that you can take that is really good for eyesight. And so it'd be a great place. And so it makes sense that Jesus would come across this guy who is on, along this road between Jericho and Jerusalem. And it tells me something about this guy, and it's this, that this man, he realized his condition. He realized his condition. Like people who told him all these things he should do, and he realized, you know what? That's what's going to be best for me. And so he realized that I'm blind, I'm a beggar, I'm desperate, and I want to be healed. And so he planted himself along the road between Jericho and Jerusalem. Now, most of us, I have to be careful how I say this, but most of us don't really know what it's like to be desperate. Now, you might say, oh, you have no idea, but I mean... Most of us don't know what it's truly like to be desperate. And the biggest reason is because we don't realize our own condition. Like we don't realize our true condition. Now, this is Memorial Day weekend, and, and so because it's Memorial Day weekend, we in, here in America, we appreciate the sacrifices that were made by men and women so that we can have our freedom, so that we can live the way that we live here. And so we're thankful for that. But there is a great danger that comes 
for living in America. As American Christians, we are the wealthiest nation in the history of the world. Not just the wealthiest nation right now, but in the history, like from all of time, right now in America, we are the wealthiest nation in the history of the world. And so as American Christians, it is rare for us to be in a place of desperation where we don't have the means, the resources, some sort of program that we can enter that will help us to get out of the situation. Rick Warren, he's a pastor from California, he said this, it's the lack of sense of desperation for God that is so deadly. If we don't feel desperate for God, we don't tend to cry out for him. You see, if we never learn to be dependent on God, then we'll never learn desperation. And if we don't learn desperation, then we'll never cry out to him. You know what that sounds like to me? It sounds like being blind. To think that I don't need God, that I can make it without him, that I don't need this Jesus stuff. It's all just make up. To me, that's what it sounds like to be blind. See, most of the time we read this story in Mark chapter 10. And as we're reading through this story, we hear it and we go, wow, Jesus has the power to heal people who are blind. And the gospel writer, Mark, takes this story and he flips it on its head. If you read through the entire chapter of Mark, chapter 10, he flips the whole story on his head because the story, if you just pay attention to the blind man being healed, you have missed the bigger thing that Jesus was trying to communicate to all those people to hear, and that is this. The bigger picture is the man who was blind was the one who could see, but the, one who could, the ones who could see were actually blind. I'm going to say it again. The man who was blind could actually see, but the ones who could see were actually blind. Verse 47 says this. It says, uh, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth. I'm going to pause just for one second. Jesus of Nazareth. Like he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth. Now most of the time if you were doing a study of the culture at this time and someone said it was Jesus of Nazareth, it would have meant absolutely nothing to you because there was nothing important about Nazareth. It was a nothing town. As a matter of fact, in John, uh, when one of the disciples was being recruited, it says Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? It was 